really great to be here to talk to you today about this fascinating topic. In financial year 2018, Alan Joyce was the highest paid chief executive in Australia, earning just under 24 million. Now, headlines like these create a lot of controversy. So let me paint a bit of a picture. First of all, only about 2 million of this was base salary or funds that Alan was certain to receive. Most of the 24 million actually came from the one-off sale of shares because several years prior to the headline, he had been awarded a parcel of Qantas shares. So over several years, Qantas share prices increased and because Qantas was a top performing company, both in a global and domestic context, Alan Joyce was able to sell those shares and, uh, and earn this large sum of money. So I guess you could argue that if anyone deserves this kind of reward, uh, it's probably Alan Joyce because Qantas has been a top performer. And to his credit, he is now working for zero salary during the pandemic. But this uh, headline was overshadowed because a new record was set for CEO pay in financial year 2019. Almost $38 million went to Andrew Barkler, who's a CEO probably most people haven't even heard of. He's at IDP Education, which provides services to students wanting to study in Australia and other countries. Now we'll come back to this case uh, at the end of the presentation, but I guess that the question I want to hone in on today is are we as shareholders getting good value from this situation? So let's remember that probably everybody in this webinar is a shareholder through their super fund or their retirement funds. Um, are we, is this situation working well for us? And so we can look at the academic literature to see what research has been done in this area. When I look at the academic literature, I observe broadly two schools of thought, efficient contracting and managerial power. The efficient contracting school of thought says that the size and the composition of CEO pay is simply reflective of a very competitive international labour market. So people who are highly talented in all spheres, whether it be entertainment, sport, or even these rock star CEOs can command very high salaries because they add a lot of value. And what we observe is really just the honest attempt of directors to optimize firm value. So that's one perspective. The other perspective, managerial power, says no, in fact, these uh, executive compensation payments are excessive. Uh, they come about because managers are greedy and they're able to exploit uh, directors who are not really doing their job of protecting shareholder interests. Remember, directors are not paying the executives out of their own funds, they're paying out of our funds, out of shareholder funds. Uh, now, it's particularly easy for greedy managers to exploit this situation through forms of remuneration that are difficult for small shareholders to either observe or understand. So examples could be through options, loans, excessive severance payments, perks, and the like. This chart is giving us a long-term perspective of the composition of CEO composition. Now notice this is for large listed companies in the United States. Between 1992 and 2011, we get a picture of the various components. So let's start at the bottom. The blue bars represent base salary. And we can see that this has barely changed 
over the period. The next section, the pink bars, this is cash bonuses, and they have increased a bit uh, over the years, except for a, a blip at the time of the GFC. But I guess one of the notable points in this chart is the very dramatic increase in total remuneration during the 90s. Now that came about because of shareholder pressure. Shareholders wanted CEOs to have a lot more pay performance sensitivity. They wanted to align, better align the interests of uh, executives and shareholders. And the feeling at the time was that the best way to do this was through stock options. So that's, this is the purple bars uh, that increased dramatically. Notice that from the early 2000s, stock options fell away somewhat. Uh, that was largely because of a change in accounting standards. Uh, and instead, we see that restricted stock, this is the orange bars, became more popular. So, in fact, as that 2018, about 50% of CEO remuneration comes from restricted stock. Let me quickly explain what I mean by restricted stock. Uh, what happens here is that executives are awarded shares and options, uh, but they can't immediately sell or exercise them. They have to wait several years uh, until the vesting period is complete. So because of this restriction, there is significant risk involved here for the executives. So the shares could fall in value. Uh, in the worst case, they could fall to zero value. Okay? So there is significant risk from the executive perspective. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an up-to-date version of this chart, uh, but if we want to look at the total uh, remuneration over the long term, uh, this analysis comes from a different source, uh, and we see that, in fact, over the period 1978 to 2018, CEO pay for, this is again, large listed firms in the US, rose by 940% or 10 times, close to 10 times. Now that overshadows significantly the rise in the index over the period of about 700%. And it completely dwarfs the growth in pay for other workers, particularly if we look at the poor typical worker in the US with only 12% increase over that period. So this really brings us to the first of three controversies that I want to discuss with you today. The first controversy relates to relativities between senior executives and typical workers. When we see a massive disparity um, economists refer to this as a tournament incentive system. So the word tournament is a reference to sporting competitions where we observe that players who get knocked out at the low, uh, in the early rounds, earn very little compared with the players that make it all the way to the finals. Um, and there is plenty of evidence to suggest that this kind of tournament incentive creates very strong incentives for people to work hard throughout the organization. So people who are at the lower levels aspire to climb the ladder, to make it through to the, uh, the finals or at least the semifinals. So yes, it's very motivating, but it's also fair to say that there are some problems. Uh, it's more likely in this setting that you're going to get misconduct and fraud. Um, and let's be honest, I think there's, uh, it, it frankly doesn't pass the pub test. So for the general public, uh, people are often offended uh, that it just doesn't seem fair that someone, no matter how good they are, should earn so much money compared with the general person. And there's new research coming out suggesting 
that it's very difficult for executives to identify with lower level employees uh, in this setting. How can you be one of the lads or one of the lasses uh, if you're earning 300 times more than they are? The next controversy I want to come to is the issue of pay without performance. So a lot of people are fine with the idea that strong performers should be well rewarded. Okay? Uh, and by doing that, of course, you're able to attract um, the best staff. However, what's concerning is that very often it seems that people are getting rewarded even when they haven't performed very well. So if we think of um, share price, the fact that executives are often awarded shares, uh, we notice that, of course, a rising share market lifts all boats, even the ones with mediocre captains. Um, so that could be a problem. There are, in fact, ways of addressing that issue, but they're not universally applied. And then we come to the question of cash bonuses. So too often, it seems that cash bonuses have become more of an entitlement. They're not truly at risk. And we saw a very uh, obvious example of this in the case of the Commonwealth Bank. Uh, and you might recall that the chairman uh, now, uh, Catherine Livingston, had to appear before the Royal Commission and defend what was, in fact, the rather indefensible level of bonuses in financial year 2016. So the story here is that the then CEO, Ian Narev, recommended that all of the executives, bar one, um, should get their full entitlement, despite the fact that the company at that time was absolutely mired in scandal. And the one person who wasn't getting their full bonus, they should have a discount of 5%. Now, his recommendation then went to the board for discussion, as it should. Uh, and rather scandalously, the board devoted a mere 10 minutes to discussing this matter. Uh, and after that time, the stroke of the pen awarded millions and millions uh, to these executives. Uh, so it was scandalous. Is there a solution here? Well, increasingly it appears that um, institutional investors can do something about this. They can work behind the scenes uh, to make changes. So here's some findings from a fairly recent report. Uh, now, this analysis relates to financial year end of 2019. So all of this is pre-pandemic. Notice that uh, the median bonus awarded to CEOs in the large companies was 60% of maximum. And that compares with 70% of maximum in the previous year. In 2019, there were 12 CEOs that were awarded zero bonus compared with only one in the previous year. So this suggests that at last, some CEOs are starting to miss out. And that's as it should be. These rewards should only be for the high performing executives. The third controversy I wanted to discuss today is the idea of um, fraud and hidden risks. Okay. So uh, an executive could uh, cook the books. So they could create apparent profits that are not true profits, thereby qualifying for their bonus. And then it might be that only some years later, it becomes obvious that a fraud has occurred. But by this time, this, the executives have already taken their cash bonuses and sold their shares. The same argument applies to the idea of hidden risks. So executives could engage in business strategies that are actually quite risky, but are not obviously so uh, to external parties. So in the short term, the profits look good, but only sometime later 
the chickens come home to roost and losses, uh, losses are incurred. But by this time, it's too late. The money's been paid out. So um, it's interesting to, in this context, come back to IDP education. You remember, we started the webinar with the example of Andrew Barkler, who earned almost $38 million last year. So let's look at this story. IDP uh, had its initial public offering back in 2015, and the share price at that time was $3.40. Over the years, the share price has uh, increased quite significantly and reached a peak of about $25. So Andrew Barclay was able to cash in his chips when the share price was very high. Uh, so um, then, of course, the pandemic. Okay. So in 2020, we see that the business model of IDP is much riskier than was apparent in 2019. The share price fell by about 45%. So I guess I have to question whether we really have good alignment of, of incentives here between Andrew Barclay, who's already cashed in his chips, and the rest of us shareholders who uh, are still experiencing all of this risk. I should point out, however, that in the last month, IDP has reported its 2020 results which were unexpectedly good, and the share price has recovered somewhat. So uh, this will be an interesting case to continue watching. So uh, I am concerned about the issue of long-term incentives. My view is that uh, what the, the so-called long-term incentives that exist at the moment are typically only three to five years, which I don't consider really to be long term, particularly when you consider some of the risks like climate change that pan out over decades. Okay. So if we want our executives to really manage for the long term, and let's remember we shareholders through our super funds, we have a truly long term perspective. We want that long-term perspective to be important for executives. So here at Macquarie Business School, uh, we are actively, actively researching this issue to see if there are better ways of incentivizing executives through having longer vesting periods uh, and through including malice and clawback clauses so that if it turns out that profits were achieved either through fraud or excessive risk, that there is some possibility of malice and clawback. So um, I know that uh, in an audience like this, there will be a wide range of views, but I always find that there are a lot of people that are quite angry and offended by the extent of executive compensation. If you're in that camp, what I suggest you do is that you write to your super fund. Okay? You actually do have a voice. Super funds have a legal obligation to represent your interests as members. Institutional investors can and do lobby directors behind the scenes, and they also vote on remuneration reports at the AGM. So research is showing that institutional investors can turn the dial and influence company policy, but they're much more likely to do this if they know they have the support of their membership base and they can use that as leverage. So write a letter of, uh, to your super fund if these matters concern you. I think you have a lot more power than you realize to make a difference. Now I'm going to stop there uh, I've presented quite a lot of material and I'd love to hear the questions that you have and uh, hopefully I can uh, answer them. Thanks very much, Elizabeth, and good morning, everyone. 
So Elizabeth, is CEO remuneration higher in the US than other countries? And if so, why? Well, yes, it is higher, um, but there's a few factors to consider. So the United States has some very large companies. And it's always the case that larger companies pay more than smaller companies. So that's one factor. Another factor is the type of industry. Different industries have different remuneration norms. Technology companies in particular tend to pay better. So um, yes, there is a difference uh, in remuneration, but a lot of that difference is explained by the factors that I've just mentioned. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. We've got a great question here from Fiona, and that is, does Qantas remuneration spike because results are so volatile? Uh, yes, so what we, results are volatile in uh, an industry like airlines. Uh, and so, you know, we have a situation where uh, the executives can cash out, they can sell their shares at a time when the share price is high. Um, yeah, that, that's the, well, I guess it's the nature of the markets that there is going to be a certain degree of volatility. Thanks very much. So why do you think that CEO pay has increased by 940%? That's a question from Julia. Okay. Um, I think that one of the factors is that uh, it's to do with managerial greed, as I explained. Uh, humans are, tend to be greedy. Um, but I think they have, um, one of the problems is to do with flaws in the executive search process. Okay? So when a position becomes available for CEO, very often only you know, two or three candidates are put forward by the, uh, you know, the headhunter firms. So if you've only got a small candidate pool that you're negotiating with, you're not in a very strong negotiating position. Uh, and there is actually evidence that uh, the use of remuneration consultants is contributing to the problem. So th those are some of the other factors. Okay, so we've got um, a lengthy question here from Randall, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because it's a good one. JP Morgan observed that the defining feature of his poorly performing clients was a tendency to overpay those at the top of the company. Morgan believes that very high salaries at the top disrupt the team and they make even high ranking people in the company see their own top management as adversaries rather than as colleagues. And that quenches any willingness to say we and to exert oneself except in one's own immediate self-interest. Is this still true? And is there any proof that the qualities of one individual make such a key difference in organisational results? Mm -hmm. Yes, look, I, I mean, you, there's a lot of points that we could tease out uh, in that question. Um, I am very concerned about the issue of self-interest. Uh, I, I, from some of the research that I've been doing, uh, it seems that uh, having a self-interested culture is creating an, an environment that's right for fraud and misconduct. Uh, and I tend to think that these uh, remuneration structures do create uh, a, a self-interested culture, as well as some of the other problems. So, uh, yeah, the, yeah we, we really need to look hard at, what, while there are benefits uh, of motivation, some of these other problems that you allude to, I, I believe, are significant. And another great question here from Bjorn. Bjorn is asking, are you seeing an increase in bonuses and restricted stock being linked to non-stock performance, for example, employee engagement? Okay, so uh, yes, uh, there is certainly uh, lately, uh, what we, we've seen the use of what we might call the balance scorecard. So bringing in some other measures of performance other than just uh, financial. Those do worry me because I think uh, from the point, while I think that um, criteria like customer outcomes are very important, uh, I certainly don't question that. The problem is that they are so difficult to measure in the short term. I think they're very open to gaming and manipulation. So I, I don't see those non-financial measures as being a good solution. I think deferrals 
are a much better solution based on the research that we've been doing. So I'm interested in your thoughts here, Elizabeth, about a question around a lack of gender and cultural diversity in boards. What role does that play in the C-suite in executive remuneration? Yes, look, I, I honestly, it's a good question. And I, I haven't seen research specifically uh, looking at, at it. So I don't think I can really answer it, uh, except, you know, to get, my hunch would be that probably males do better than females at negotiating um, high remuneration packages. Um, yeah, I don't know that I can say anything more. Okay, so are there any examples of companies with good executive remuneration structures here in Australia that you could potentially name? Um, yes, yeah, so I think for me, it's all about long term. Okay, uh, so the longer term, the longer the vesting periods, uh, the better. Uh, I tend to focus a lot of my attention on financial institutions. Uh, I'm in the Department of Applied Finance. They tend to be my area of special interest. Uh, and I'd point to uh, Macquarie Group as an example of a financial institution that does well at uh, having very long-term incentives. And that, has, uh, that has, appears to have served them pretty well. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. So a question here from Sue Ann. What kind of other things are you able to voice to your super fund? Does this still apply for people with self-managed super funds? Well, if you have a self-managed super fund, uh, then it's much harder for you to have a voice unless you are very rich. <laughs> so it, uh, I, I guess it means that you will, I mean, you can vote on um, uh, at the, at the um, AGM, uh, but the large super funds inevitably are going to have a bigger say. Okay, and can you tell us what role has the two strikes rule played or not played in addressing challenges with executive remuneration? Well, I think two strikes rule uh, has, has certainly raised the stakes. So I've seen, since the two strikes rule came in, and sorry, I perhaps should explain uh, for other members of our audience, this is new regulation that came in a few years ago that said, that gave um, shareholders the ability to uh, vote against uh, the remuneration report at the AGM. And after two, and after two vo votes against the REM report, then it, uh, then that can trigger a board spill. So I think it has certainly raised the stakes and uh, it has meant that directors are much more focused on this issue than they used to be. It's given shareholders more stick, if you will, uh, to pressure the board. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. We've got another question here from Andrew and he's asking, do you have a view on good pre-vest metrics for boards to use for long-term variable REM and the role of hard metrics versus discretion? Right. Um, look, ultimately, discretion is important. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer, you know, you can't measure everything, okay? Uh, some things just don't lend themselves to objective measurement. Uh, um, I think that we need to see more discretion used by directors. I think sometimes they're afraid to do that. Um, it's the same thing. I mean, I, I think of myself as uh, in my role as an academic. So I grade students' papers and I have to use my judgment. Sometimes I give students bad marks and they will push back. Okay? They will complain, they'll argue, they'll ask, they'll, they will demand that I justify my poor mark. Um, but that's my job. And I would say it's exactly the same for directors. They need to do their job. They need to sometimes be willing to use their judgment uh, and to apply consequences uh, and be prepared to live with the pushback. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Unfortunately, although we do have other questions, that's all we've got time for for Q&A today. I'd like to hand back to you to summarise for us before we pass back to Tony to close. Thank you.
Yes, so I guess just in, uh, in closing, can I just remind you that we are actively researching in this space. We would love your support. Um, please link in with me through uh, LinkedIn. Uh, that way, I, as I continue with my research, uh, you can be aware of the findings. Uh, and as, as uh, Tony mentioned earlier, I do have a new book coming out early next year on risk governance, uh, biases, blind spots and bonuses. Uh, so that's something to look out for. Um, join me on LinkedIn. Back to you, Tony. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Uh, you've raised a lot of interesting uh, challenges there for, for us all, both the boards and for, and for management. Uh, our follow-up email will include a link to a recording of today's webinar, and it will also include additional resources that will help you to further explore this topic, should you wish. Macquarie Business School offers a range of short courses covering all the management disciplines, both virtual and face-to-face. -face. And our contact details are showing on the screen now. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned that uh, one of the ways of uh, addressing the question of, of excessive remuneration is possibly increasing the pool of, of leaders. So uh, possibly one way of, of doing that is actually companies investing in uh, building their pool of leaders through investing in training and development of, of, leader pro of leadership programs. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for participating. The activity on the Q&A forum and the chat forum was, uh, was very, very busy. So thank you very much for that. Thank you again to Elizabeth for her insights today. And we'd encourage you to keep your eye out for future webinars and short courses offered by Macquarie Business School. Thank you. Thank you.